So as I mentioned last time, trust is a vital element of digital marketing. And I was able to conduct a study a little while ago with Hassam Shrar, who's now at YouTube, at uh, Google, and Lise Couture, uh, who is a professor of computer science, trying to understand how trust works within a digital marketing space and how, as marketers, we can uh, understand that better and use that understanding to our advantage. Right? So this was motivated partially by some experiences Hassam had had himself. Uh, but let's imagine this scenario, right? Mary is sent a coupon from a marketer, invite a friend and get 10% off your next purchase. And she says, you know what? I'm just gonna spam that to everyone. I'm gonna get everyone to be involved in this, right? Um, and so she sends it off. Now, Anne and Janet, they both like books. They're like, this is a great coupon. Thanks for sending it, Mary. Uh, but John and Bob, who knows, maybe they're illiterate for whatever reason, they don't like books and don't, don't respond very positively to this email, right? And so as a result of this, um, you could say that Anne and Janet's trust in Mary's decision about what appropriate content to send them grows where John and Bob's decreases, right? And this is vital for a marketer because that trust level, knowing whose consumers there are, are the, kind of a keystone to sending these referrals. So John gets a, a coupon uh, from MovieRental.com. It's an online streaming service, right, for instance. Refer a friend and get $10 off your next rental. Apparently, these are very expensive movie rentals. Maybe they last for a year or something like that, right? Um, so John says, you know, Bob and Mary are definitely going to be interested. Uh, however, I think Anne is not interested in movies. She seems to like books a lot, but I don't think she likes movies. So uh, I'm not going to send it to her. So John does the, you know, somewhat the appropriate thing and does not send it to Anne, but sends it to Mary and Bob who respond positively to this uh, nice coupon they sent along, right? And what happens over time as we continue to play this, right, is that Mary and Bob's trust grows in John. And Mary, who constantly spams everyone, she loses trust over time from all these different interactions she has with people. Uh, whereas John, who is very selective, who chooses who to send things to, people trust his decision, trust the fact that he's actually going to send them a valuable piece of information, partially because he understands them. And as a result, uh, they're going to grow in their trust for them. And so one of the questions here is really, as marketers, if we're going to be interested in this influence game, if we're going to be interested in trying to identify people people are going to pass along positive messages about our brand. How do we identify people? How do we cause or get them to act more like John and less like Mary, right? So we looked at this in the context of a dig.com data set. And dig, uh, if you are not familiar with it, is a news, a collaborative news website. Uh, now it's got a different format than it did when we looked at it, but it's very similar. Uh, it, the, the format that it had was very similar to the Reddit format is now, right? Um, and in this format, we looked at a social network of about 12,000 users and all their relationships between each other. And so I could follow you, and whenever you post a piece of content, I could see what content you posted, uh, and then I could decide whether or not I wanted to dig it, right, like that content in modern parlance, right? Um, and we also had a dig network. So we, we knew 48,500 stories that people had posted. We knew, we knew 1.9 million dig edges, so we know people who said, yes, I like that piece of content. And we looked at this content for six months uh, from July 2010 to December 2010. One interesting side effect of what we found, right, and this doesn't have to do much with trust, but it's something that we're going to have to see in digital marketing and understand a little bit more, is that we're constantly seeing echo chambers at work in uh, digital marketing. And what we mean by echo chambers is that there are groups of individuals on the, the web, on the internet, on, on the various platforms, whether it be Twitter or Facebook, who talk to each other and do so in such a way that they keep reinforcing the same messages and they're not exposed to more diverse messages, right? Um, so in this particular study, uh, what we did was we looked at how different two individuals were in terms of the things that they liked when we started the study. And this is this KL divergence statistic on the y-axis, right? So if the divergence statistic is zero, it means basically when the study started, they like the same things in many respects, that they post about the same things. If it's high 18, it means they were far apart. They didn't like the same things, right? But, um, but they were peers, they were related, they were connected to each other. What we found and what, what we shaded this with is how many times they both dug the same story after we started the study, right? And what we found was that over time, 
people who started out similar to each other by the end of the study were liking more and more of the same things. And that people who started out different from each other by the end of the study were liking less and less of the same things. So as a result, what we're seeing is we're seeing this splitting apart the creation of these echo chambers within this system, right? We're not arguing that, you know, there's been some good evidence other ways for other platforms uh, that says the echo chambers don't exist, but at least in our particular study, we seem to find some evidence they do exist. I don't want to talk too much about the actual model we built, but essentially what we did, what we showed was that if we can take into account how much someone trusts someone based upon their past experience, how many times they upvoted or liked something that someone else said, then we could use that as a measure to predict whether or not they were going to like another piece of content that was delivered to them by that user. In other words, the best predictor of whether or not someone actually has a truly trustful influence in a social network is how many times that content that they've shared in the past has been trusted. Right? And so by taking into account both those trust levers and the heterogeneity of the preferences. So, so for instance, I might trust you very well on a particular topic, but if I don't care about that topic, I'm not going to vote on it very much. Right? I can gain a more nuanced understanding of how social media information diffuses through a network. Right? Um, so we showed that our model did better in many respects of modeling that trust. Now, based upon that idea, we can start thinking about new mechanisms for rewarding individuals in this area. So traditionally, the way viral marketing is rewarded is that we give someone a reward if they pass on a recommendation and that recommendation accepted. So if I, if I give you a coupon that says get 10% off your next uh, um, purchase if someone else buys something as well, right? There's no penalty for you for passing that on to everyone. What if instead I said, here's three of these things you can pass on, um, and I limit the number of ones. And so as a result, you have to be strategic about who you pass on to them, right? What we found is if we did that and we carried out those experiments, that people were able, we were able to increase the amount of trust that people had in the network, and we were able to, in fact, increase the amount of purchases that happened. Right? So essentially what happens in this experience is that the average confidence level of the whole network, in other words, the trust people, the consumers having each other grows because they're not spamming each other all the time. Right? And if you balance it correctly, the adoption percentage of the network also grows at the same time. So you get all the benefits of a referral mechanism where everyone can spam everyone, but without the cost of the lack of confidence and as a result, the decrease in the adoption rates. Moreover, what we found is that this trust score that we had developed, right, where we had created this idea that certain individuals trusted certain individuals within the network to talk on a particular topic, was a very useful score. And in fact, we saw that when you average that score for an individual across all their peers, you could identify the most trusted individuals in the network, right? Using that number, you could then make really good predictions about which pieces of content would become viral in the future. What we found is that the individuals who are the most, if you looked at the content that was shared by individuals who are the most trusted, that was more likely to become viral content than content that was shared by people with lots of friends or by a group of random individuals, right? Uh, and so, and this, this happened across the topics uh, within DIG. So trust allows us to make better predictions about adoption if we can take into account both the heterogeneous preferences that people have for content and for trusting individuals and the dynamic nature of trust. The fact that if you abuse my trust, I am less likely to trust content you send me in the future. As a result of this, I want you to understand that looking at these kind of notions of trust and heterogeneity over consumer spaces can really improve our digital marketing strategies.